scripture reading and verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who is trying our hearts. My title is Entrusted with the Gospel. To entrust, to give charge or responsibility to someone for something. Paul and Timothy and Silas is who Paul is referring to when he says we, they were entrusted with the gospel, with the responsibility to speak that gospel. And there's a way in which today as a church and ministers of the church, we are all entrusted with the gospel. So why are we here this morning? Well, we're taking an interlude from the compound names of God that we've been looking at, number one. Number two, we looked at chapter one earlier in this year, and we wanted to come back to chapter two and particularly focus on verse four and Paul's boldness and his confidence in a time of great contention when he spoke the gospel. And to further clarify and look at Paul's life here as it relates to being militant, the word we used last Sunday, which means to engage in combat and in war. How did Paul and the ministry engage in the battle and in the contention that they were confronted with, not only at Thessalonica, but everywhere they went? Because as we stated last Sunday, the devil brings the fight to the church. And you can see clearly that he's bringing it to the church today. So, first, we're going to look at Paul's entrance. You find this in verse 1. He would say, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Now, Paul has used a similar statement twice already. There's some reason Paul wants to remind this church about how he came to Thessalonica. In verse 5, he would say, for, for you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So as he writes this letter, he wants them to remember and look at something that would affirm the way, the manner in which Paul and Silas and Timothy entered and came into Thessalonica. Verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And then in verse 1 of chapter 2, You know our entrance. Now what is Paul after? Paul is being accused of being a charlatan, a shyster, a snake oil salesman of sorts. You can see his defense with the wording he uses in chapter 2. In verse 3 he says, For our exhortation was not of deceit. Paul is a deceiver. It was not of uncleanness. Paul has impure motives. It was not of guile. Paul is a shyster, a trickster. He uses guile. The next verse, verse 4. We did not come pleasing men. Paul is nothing but a man pleaser. Verse 5. Neither at any time use we flattery. Paul's just flattering people. Nor of covetousness. He's after the money. Nor of glory sought we from men. Paul is after praise and the glory of men. You can see either someone is influencing the church to think that about Paul. Or maybe they begin to wonder this themselves. Because in Thessalonica, when the angry mob came after Paul and they found Jason and assaulted his house, they took them to the magistrates looking for Paul and they sent Paul out by night. So Paul left abruptly from Thessalonica. Perhaps they were influenced and the church was saying, yeah, what about Paul? He just comes into town like a charlatan and off he goes. A charlatan is someone who uses trickery and guile to gain money or some advantage. That used to be called a snake oil salesman years ago when a man would come into town or a community, set up shop, and he had some potion, some miraculous cure that if you just paid the money and followed the directions for about 30 days, take it every day, you'll have some improvement, something good in life will happen. And the 30 days gave him just enough time to get out of town. Paul is going to point specifically to one thing, and perhaps more in chapter 1, that demonstrates he's not a charlatan. A charlatan's very premise 
is to offer something really good, really life-improving to get people to follow the deception. But what happened to these people? You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. See, that goes against being a charlatan. Even Paul in chapter 3 told them immediately, when you become a Christian, you will suffer. So how could Paul be a deceiver when the very gospel he preached meant nothing good in life in terms of possessions and health that actually brought worse health? Because they were harmed. They were persecuted. They were injured for the cause of Christ. He would even say Macedonia and Achaia. They show themselves how we entered in among you. Your faith to God is being spread abroad. We don't need to say anything. Because even in persecution, even in much contention and suffering, from you the word of God is being sounded out. And so the other regions of Greece were proof that Paul wasn't a charlatan. He was not in it for the money. He was not using guile and trickery. He was no snake oil salesman. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, You know, brothers, how we entered. Even we ourselves suffered before at Philippi. And when Paul got to Thessalonica, what happened? Much contention. The charlatans of our day who peddle a gospel or a religion, maybe a prosperity of gospel, a gospel of self-improvement, will not suffer for the potion in the bottle. And that proves Paul is not a shyster, the way he entered. Now here's our first application. How do you enter among the unsaved? How do we enter in Huntsville or in the workplace or in our community? See, Paul is speaking of his integrity. What Paul spoke is what Paul believed in his heart is what Paul suffered for. He's speaking with regard to the motives of his heart. He was sincere. He was genuine. He was no deceiver. How do we enter in a culture that is politically unstable? Mass confusion and hysteria abound. In a culture where the sexual revolution has an agenda, and the only thing that stands in the way of that agenda primarily is the truth, the church of living God. Now think about this church right here. From them is sounding out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but every place. So they need to be people of integrity. They need to enter into society and in the culture and in the regions where their faith to God is spread abroad with people that are sincere of heart. What if these very people confronting the culture of idolatry and sensuality were captured by the same idolatry? And sensuality. Well, apparently that was happening in Thessalonica, chapter 4, and about the fourth verse. For this is the will of God that you abstain from fornication. This is the will of God, even your sanctification or your holiness, that you abstain from fornication. That every man should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor or holiness. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner. For God is the avenger of all such. We have testified and we have forewarned you. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Paul uses two words that encompass every form of sensuality. Fornication and uncleanness, which includes adultery, pornography, and all forms of sensuality. How is the church Entering. What kind of people are we that enter into a society for which we will readily speak truth against the LGBTQ community, and yet are we captured by the same idolatry that we are seeking to help people with the gospel to overcome? Now, beloved, I know there are plenty in this room with prior experience with those very sins. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. But the call for a militant church is not to be militant only corporately, but individually. We lose our credibility when a charlatan preacher, or perhaps a genuine man of God, is taken down by the very sin 
that he's speaking against. It's very possible, isn't it? Is it not possible for any of us to be taken by any sin? We must be vigilant, sober, as we said last Sunday. Fighting the good fight of faith. Because we're called upon to enter in society among the unsaved. And present a gospel that we say has rescued and redeemed. A gospel that empowers us to fight against sensuality, but it's a fight. And so we must engage in the war. Paul would say in this same chapter, chapter 4, he would say in verse 5, Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. So we live in a culture, a culture of unsaved people like we were that don't know God. So how do they possess their own body? In the passion of lust. In our culture, sexuality is just the norm in terms of sin. It's just expected. In fact, you're odd if you don't engage in the same kind of sensuality that we find in the world. But the church is called to be people who were rescued from those forms to fight them in order to enter as Paul and Silas and Timothy. You know what manner of men, can we say that? You know when we spoke the truth to you. You know we were sincere with the gospel. And we weren't saying one thing with our lips, and in our hearts we were totally captured by the same sin. How is it that we pursue holiness? Well, Paul says the Gentiles don't know God, but those that pursue holiness know Him. And God says He's he's given us His Holy Spirit to battle, to fight, to be militant. Not first out there, but in here in our own souls against the sins that we can easily still struggle with, right? So this is not a message to condemn anybody here who is struggling with that sin or those sins. Or maybe you've been taken down. The call is to look to Christ, to get help, beloved. If you're consumed with one of these sins, you need help from the gospel. And if you can't be militant to overcome that yourself, then you need to get the help from the church and from the word that God gives us so that we can enter among the unsaved in a way that we have credibility. Not that we have no sin, Not that we can't fall to sin, but that first we're being militant against the sins of our own hearts and the sins that we're easily tempted with. Because the gospel that we present, as Paul says, we speak, even so we speak, is the gospel that gave Paul the power to overcome sin in his own life and then to be a man of integrity, which means a person of wholeness. He wasn't duplicit. He wasn't speaking about their idolatry. All the while, he was holding tight to his own idols. He was warring, he was fighting, and he was a man of integrity. So our entrance must be one of integrity, which means we keep the fight by the Holy Spirit to know God in such a way, His supremacy by faith, that it empowers us to confess and to seek help and get the forgiveness that our Father gives us every day. Number two, not only his entrance, now his confidence or his boldness. He says again in verse 1, Yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold, we were confident, we were courageous in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Now, you might expect Paul to look to results in the conversions of the church. And he he did so as uh, the power of his integrity was they were transformed even while they were suffering. The word vain means fruitless or without results. So he says, you know when we came in among you that our ministry was not fruitless. But here, rather than turning to what he did in chapter 1, he turns to his own suffering. You know that in Philippi, before we suffered and were shamefully entreated. You know the story of Philippi in Acts chapter 16. Paul comes into town. There's this 
young damsel that has the spirit of divination. She has some demon possession. And that gave her insight into the lives of other people, for which her owners, her masters, used that for great gain. You can imagine uh, being able to know what people were thinking and what they were doing, how that could bring gain to wicked men. Well, she knowing what Paul and Silas and Timothy were about, followed them around constantly saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. They show unto you the way of salvation. Well, Paul was grieved with that, not because that was true, because this young lady was captured by a demon. Finally, he turns to this demon and says, come out of her, for which he does. And then the owners see the hope of their gain gone. They grab the ministry team, bring them before the magistrates, and they suffer shamefully. Now that word brings together not just painful suffering, but humiliation, insult, and reproach. They beat them publicly. That's one thing to suffer shame, but to do it in the eyes of others adds a dimension of pain that's difficult. Then they threw them in prison, put them in stocks, which was a difficult position to be in on the floor with your legs out and your arms and your legs bound by the stocks, your back bleeding, laid open by the scourge. Now Paul points to that and then his confidence or boldness of God as the reason his ministry was fruitful. What is he saying? He's saying without boldness in God, there are no conversions, at least through Paul's ministry, because he never would have made it to Thessalonica. Now, if you had been beaten like that and put in prison, and the miraculously God allows your escape by the earthquake and what happened in Philippi, and now you're walking your way to Thessalonica, and your aim is to preach the same gospel, what do you think is going to happen? Exactly what happened. Much contention. See, the reason Paul didn't quit, the reason Paul kept going, is because he had confidence in God. This is what we need in our day, beloved. This is what I desperately need. This is not part of my personality. Now, you may have a kind of boldness that just part of your psyche, your personality. But this is not what we're talking about here. Paul didn't get this from being who he was. Now he was rather bold before he was converted, but now his boldness is in the Holy Ghost. Because he says our boldness was in God. That would be the Holy Spirit. His boldness is in the Godhead. It's in his Savior. That's the kind of boldness the church needs today. And that's the kind of boldness that Paul speaks of. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says these words. These things I write unto you, hoping to come to you shortly. But if I tarry long, if I wait, that you should know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So see yourself as a pillar this morning and a ground. That's what we are, using the imagery of the columns that hold up a building. What is Paul saying? He's saying, the truth for which we are pillars and grounds of is to give shape to our behavior. Timothy, he was the pastor at Ephesus. Timothy, that you would know how you should behave and how the church should behave, you have truth for that. That's a pillar and ground of the truth. The church is the place where truth is being disseminated among ourselves. But a column upholds and the imagery is defending and proclaiming it. In the ancient days, often an edict or a document was fastened to the columns of a building. So in a very literal way, the column was a place of proclamation. For that, beloved, we're going to need boldness. Because that's going to make us very unpopular in the world. The only thing that would keep us from being unpopular is to close our mouths. That's the only option. If we are to be a pillar and ground of truth, a proclaimer, a preserver, and a defender of it, God using us for that purpose, we understand He's ultimately the preserver of truth, but He's established His church in part that we would know how to behave by truth and that we'd be proclaimers of that truth. Why does that bring a problem? Because the truth is about God. It's His house and the truth is absolute, isn't it? It's inflexible. It's non-negotiable. It's unchangeable. No matter what the culture, no matter how many progressives there are, God's Word is not progressive in that sense. It is inflexibly unchangeable, and it's truth. So we don't have to decide in the future, I wonder if that will be true tomorrow. 
Secondly, the absolute truth of God is making demands. Now get this. On people's emotions, their thoughts, their desires, and their actions. Not suggestions, demands. Now there's a problem. There's a huge problem. When we take the truth to society, the gospel, the demands, sinners see themselves as sinners and then conform their life to the truth of the word and depart from sin, such as the LGBTQ agenda or any other sin. That causes massive problems. And we see that, don't we? Beloved, behind the agenda, any agenda of darkness, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and the one thing that gets in the way of the rulers of the darkness of the world are the pillar and the ground of the truth. And that's what you're supposed to be. That's what I'm supposed to be. And so as we spread the truth that makes demands on people's emotions, their affections, their desires, and their thoughts, they're going to push back. And so they are. You see, what's behind the C4 bill in Canada is not the prime minister. It's not the politicians. It's the serpent himself. And be sure that the aim of the bill is to put down Christianity. The aim of critical race theory is to To put down power structures that oppress people. And you're the power structure, so they say. In other words, your truth is oppressing women and men and people that want to identify how they want to identify. For the church, we don't get the option to decide truth for ourselves. We don't get the option to decide our gender. We don't get the option to decide what we think truth is because we're not God. God is God and therefore We don't get to decide the knowledge of good and evil like the serpent wants us to think we can. I should decide for myself what is good for me or what is bad for me. And if it's good for me to act this way, live this way, love that way, then that's good. And it's evil for me to do anything else. And now you come up, you have the nerve and the audacity to come along and say, that's not true. God is truth. And the church is to be a pillar and a ground for His truth. And therefore, we must have boldness. That's the only, that's the only way, isn't it? I'm, you may know this about me, but I don't have that. I don't have that kind of boldness. It doesn't come from my personality. It doesn't come from my psyche. If, if I ever have it, it's only going to come from the Holy Spirit. And the good news is, God has given him to every believer in this room this morning. It's there, it's resonant within us to be a kind of confidence in God that even in the face of laws and uh, anti-conversion laws, that the church, rather than capitulate, we just simply stand on the Word of God. Because that's love, isn't it? That's how you love people. We continue to proclaim the truth of God's Word. Now I just want to give you a quick reminder on this point, looking back at the church, Acts chapter 4. If you ever want to get a good example of boldness, it's just laid out right there. They were threatened, the apostles came back, as you remember, as we've noted several times, and they reported all that was done, and all that was said to them. Now imagine a kind of prayer meeting like that. I come and say, brothers, I want you to know that the the mayor of uh, downtown Huntsville just told me that if we say any more in the name of Christ, all of us go to prison, and they're going to beat us first. <laughs> you know, we're gone. <laughs> Where can we run? Where can we hide? That's not what they did. First, they prayed together. Oh, how we need to be doing that, beloved. We need to pray together in our fellowship groups and in this church assembly. They did it together. I'm sure they did it individually and in families. We need to do it together. We need to be praying together. Before church, in church, after church, together praying What did they pray? Lord, grant unto thy servants boldness. Now, if we know that's where boldness comes from, then it's only logical that we start praying for that. Now, if we think we have in ourselves, then don't ever ask God for boldness. Because you just got it, right? I mean, you can do that. But if we really know, Lord, there is no way I could face what Paul did and not run or not hide or not shut my mouth. 
And Lord, we need boldness. So they prayed for it. Secondly, they looked to the promises of God. They quoted scripture. Lord, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? From Psalm 2. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. Beloved, the kings are standing up today and the rulers of the people are gathering together against the church. I don't know how this will end in the immediate sense, meaning it may fizzle out. Things can change politically, right? God sets up rulers and puts them down. I'm not saying that this is immediately coming, but the reality is you can see the rulers of this world all over the planet are gathering together against the Lord and against His Christ, and you're the Lord's body. That means they're gathering together together against you. So what did they do? They looked to the promises. Say, Lord, the prophecy of the coming anointed one, you fulfilled victoriously in Christ. He's triumphant. They look to the promises of God. We've got to look to promises. We get our confidence from God's promises, not in one another, right? And then thirdly, they, they look to God's hand and counsel. They said, these rulers, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Jews and the Gentiles were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel before determined, pro orizo, predestinated to be done. God had before determined the crucifixion and every player in the drama in a way that he's righteous and not a sinner. And the men that did the wicked things are accountable to God because he's an incomparable sovereign. That's what we need to look to, the hand and counsel of God. Now, for example, speaking of political instability, it is rather troubling that we now basically have open borders, isn't it? I mean, that's troubling. That's not good. That's not going to be good for our country. But do you know what? The hand and counsel of God determined that our borders would be opened. So what does the church do? We pray for boldness to witness to Afghans and people from southern countries that are just flooding right into our country. See, if we lose sight of what we are as the pillar and ground of the truth, if Paul loses sight in the face of opposition, that the reason his interest was not in vain because of his confidence in God, then we get involved in all kinds of activities that are not the main point. Is God just saying, look, I'm bringing these people right to you. And you still are so off focus of my hand and my counsel and my purpose that the church is more involved in political sway than they are the gospel. Now, once again, let me go on record. record. I think that's bad. I think we need to close the borders. But God has opened them. Would you agree to that? So we pray for boldness. We ask for boldness. And we look to God. And if we have a chance to say the the border should be closed and we can vote that way, that's fine. But we don't lose sight of what God calls us to be. Because we've been entrusted with the gospel. Have we not? We're entrusted with the gospel. And I confess, it's easy for me to get distracted sometimes. Is it for you? So God today is calling us back to focus our attention. On the fact that he's entrusted the church today and her ministers with the gospel. Number three, we see Paul's approval. His approval. Now beginning in verse three, what Paul's going to do, he's going to show us where his boldness is derived. It's in God, but now he's going to show us the basis for his boldness in two general ways. Now one way will be two negatives and the other will be one positive. So as I've stated before, that's like a sandwich, if you prefer a hamburger. The two buns or the two pieces of bread on the outside are verses 3 and 5. And the center piece of the meat is our text. That, that, that's the main point we get to. We're going to look at both of them. So when Paul says we were bold in our God, he says, because. That's our cue right there. For our exhortation was not, it did not arise from deceit, uncleanness, or in guile. That's the first piece of bread. But our boldness was where? But even as we were allowed to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. All right, here's the other piece of the bun or the sandwich bread. 
For neither at any time used we flattering words. You know that. Nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Neither at any time used we or sought the glory of men. Neither of you nor yet of any other man. Now you see what Paul's doing. He just stated we were bold in our God. This is why. Negatively, our exhortation was not this way. And then again, our exhortation was not covetousness, flattery, or seeking the glory of men. What was it, Paul? Here's our centerpiece. Here's the approval. We look at in verse 5. Or verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, this is how we speak, not pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Now, Paul uses two identical words that are translated differently in the English. Dokumazo. That's the word allowed, and that's the word trieth. The word allowed is a past tense word. But the word trieth is present tense. So the word means to test, examine, to approve, or to deem fit. Now how is that helpful for Paul? Remember what he's saying is we were bold because God allowed and God is trying. He's examining my heart. Now that could be frightening. (laughs) You know. You can keep me out of your heart. And I can keep you out of my heart. But you'll never keep God out. He is in your brain 24-7. In fact, Psalm 139 says, Before you even speak a word, He knows it all together. Before you express a word, God's in your brain and He's in your heart. Now that could be frightening, but Paul doesn't see it that way. It's a comfort to Paul. If we see what Paul's saying, here is where his boldness is derived. So let's look at those two words. First, the past tense. In what way is Paul allowed or approved of God? Somewhere in the past. Or deemed fit. To be be deemed fit means to consider to think of someone in a free way according to one's own discretion. In other words, the person doing the deeming freely does so. And of course we know that the way Paul was deemed fit to be in the ministry is because Jesus said in Acts 9.15 to Ananias, Go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before kings and the Gentiles and the children of Israel. And I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul is a chosen vessel. That's why he's approved of God. It's not because God said, I can see that man's going to be faithful. I can see he can do a lot for the kingdom. I think he's going to be a good choice. What do you think, Trinity? Yeah, I think he's the man. No. He was chosen. To be a vessel. That means he was chosen as an individual and he was chosen to be in the office of an apostle. And beloved, if if you have a gift this morning, and you do, you are approved of God with that gift because God has marked you out to have it, to use it in his kingdom. Because you are accepted in the beloved. You're accepted. That will give you confidence. You're approved of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, to the praise of the glory of that grace wherein He's made us accepted in the Beloved. The Beloved is Jesus. You're accepted because you've been marked out. You've been predetermined to be God's child according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of His grace. You've been made accepted in that grace. You're approved. You have to get your confidence from that. If you start draw, draw, uh, drawing your confidence, you're trying to from how bold you are, or how well you're doing, or how much fruit you're producing, <clears throat> you're going to wake up one day with no confidence at all. You're going to wake up thinking, I don't even know if God loves me. No, we get our confidence where Paul did. We were allowed, we were approved, we were deemed fit. And so what do we do? We speak out of that confidence, out of that boldness. Not as pleasing men, but, what, but God which trieth our hearts. Now the second word is an ongoing testing, right? 
So that's a past tense done thing, but now Paul, every day he lives with the reality that God is testing him. Now how is that helpful? How is it helpful to know that God is testing your motives and your thoughts 24-7? And how does Paul respond to that in such a way that he's saying, look, my confidence in God is I have been approved by God. He's deemed me fit. That's the only reason I'm in the ministry. And God is testing my heart. Now twice in relation to this, Paul calls God his witness. In the next verse, God is witness. He's my witness, whether I'm covetous or not. And then verse 10, he says, you are witnesses and God. Now, a witness is someone that you call on your behalf to give testimony as to where you are and what you were doing at a certain time, right? Mr. Stewart, where were you on January 30th, 2022 at 1030 a.m. or at 11 a.m.? Well, just ask all these people. They were with me. That's what a witness does. What's Paul saying? God is with me. He is talking about the omniscience of God in a way that helps him be genuine and sincere and not duplicit. He lives with the reality that God knows his thoughts. It's not a terror to Paul because the God that knows his thoughts is the God that's approved of Paul, is the God that loves him. And therefore, he opens himself to the searching eye of God. You might say he asked God to search his heart. Say, that sounds a little off, but that's what David did. And we just read that, didn't we? Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Now, I don't think Paul is challenging, or David is challenging God. Okay, God, just look all you want, see if there's anything there that's wicked. No, he's asking God to reveal to him. Things that we often miss, don't we? Are you always certain of your motives? You know exactly why you did that? Exactly why you said that? Well, sometimes we do. Sometimes it's clear. You just ask the question, why did I say that? Oh yeah, I was after such and such. Now when David's talking about his enemies, he wants to make sure he has the right motive before God. He says, I hate them with a perfect hatred. Lord, search me. If I'm thinking wrong here, if I have a wrong motive, if it's not about you and it's really just about me, lead me into the way everlasting. See, So I think what Paul's saying is, God is trying my heart, is that what gives him confidence and sincerity and genuineness is that he recognizes God's presence, even in his thought life. And that's going to help Paul deal with sins of his heart before they even make expression. Because he's just talking to God daily. If you're not talking to God and recognizing His omnipresence in your heart and mind, you likely are becoming a duplicit person. Right? You might be the person that says things all the time, but in the heart, you're totally Somewhere different, means something different. Now all of us have struggle with that, don't we, beloved? See? But Paul is going to, like David, say, Lord, search my heart. He is searching my heart as a witness. And secondly, then he's going to ask God for his help, right? Does anybody struggle with covetousness or flattery words or seeking the approval and the glory of men? Does, does anybody like to be made much of? That's a good feeling, isn't it? Somebody just to praise you and think you're wonderful. So what happens when that thought arises? Lord, help me. See, it's a transparency with God. It says, God, I need help. I know that pro- I just probably said that because I was wanting them to praise me. Help me, Lord. Not to do that. You know my thoughts, Lord. You know why I just did that. Lord, I was after the gain of something. Or Lord, I, I said that for, I was flattering. See, having an awareness of God in your heart is going to help us with dealing with sin because we ask God for help and then we confess God or our sins in our hearts even when nobody else knows that we had an impure motive. Or a covetous thought. Or we were really seeking the glory of men. So Paul is saying when God is trying his heart, he is deriving boldness from that 
because he recognizes the presence of God, the witness of God, and so he keeps calling on God for help, for forgiveness, to search him, to try him, to show him. <clears throat> if indeed there were times when he spoke and it was not with real pure motives. And here's the confidence, beloved. Paul knows this. Whatever God finds in the search, whatever it is, it's already forgiven. Isn't that glorious? Whatever God finds in your heart, I don't care what it is, it's already forgiven. If, here's that conditional clause of grace, if you're confessing and committed to fighting it. Of course, he sees and finds stuff in people's hearts that are there. And it's not forgiven because they love it, they embrace it, they hold on to it, they relish it, they treasure it, they don't hate it. But the assurance and the confidence to be bold in a culture that's going to accuse you of being a charlatan. They're going to accuse you of wrong motives. They're going to say, you're a bigot, you're unloving, for which I might say, am I Lord? Am I doing this to be seen or, or for some advantage? What does Paul say? The Lord is searching my heart. And I'm open to His search, right? You can't close Him off, but I'm open to it. I'm recognizing it. And so I'm asking God, Lord, what are my motives? They're tricky. I don't always know what they are. If I'm being covetous, Lord, help me. I don't want to be. And in that way, the divine approval of Paul and the divine searching of Paul helps him to be what? Genuine, sincere, and a man of integrity. And then there's his freedom. Paul says he speaks not to please men, but God. And so what is the freedom that Paul has flowing out of that? Well, rather than speaking with deceit, uncleanness, and guile, and rather than speaking... Flattering words, covetous words, and words seeking the glory of men, he's free from that. And that's his confidence. Paul is experiencing a freedom from flattering words, which is what we say insincerely for selfish gain. Paul is experiencing, when he wrote this, a freedom for covetousness, which means Paul would have been speaking if he was covetous, for the gain of money. He was free from that. Paul is free from seeking the glory of men. And the pleasure. That we sometimes derive from people praising us and saying bravo you're the greatest. That feels good doesn't it? Paul was free from that. How was he free from that? Because he's a God seeker. The pleasures of men is to accommodate yourself to the opinions and the thoughts of others. If Paul is like that, he wants to gain their praise. But clearly he's not because he suffered for what he said. He is a God pleaser. He seeks to please God, doesn't he? And he can only do that by faith according to Hebrews 11.6. By faith, it's the only way to please God. So he was coming to God, believing that God is, he is all for him. He is his help, his strength, his redemption, his wisdom, his righteousness. God is everything to us. And that God is his reward. See? And what is it that pleases God about Paul being entrusted with the gospel? That Paul found God to be a greater treasure than the gain of men, the gain of money, and the gain of pleasures in this life. He's a free man. He's not a man that's free from the struggle. He's not a man that's free from the temptation. He's not a man that's free from sinning. We know that from Romans 7. But he's a free man. And so his confidence, the basis is his approval and his freedom. Because his desire is to please God. Is that your desire this morning, beloved? Is it your greatest desire to please God? To be a pleasure to God? You remember when Paul was converted, he had two questions. Who, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Next question. 
What do you want me to do? What? Have we ever asked that question of God? What is it? You redeemed me. He was astonished and trembling. I guess so. (laughs) He's been in a tirade against this man. And now the man has arrested him by His grace. Whatever you want me to do. That's the question you should be asking. And then of course we go to the Bible to find out. Paul's a free man. Are you? I don't mean are you free from sinning, beloved. I'm not free in that sense. Are you free because you're fighting not just a militant battle with the world, but inside with a heart that loves God and sees God as supreme and great treasure? If you have faith, you have the power to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on the treasure of eternal life, who is Jesus Christ. And then lastly, His love. Now look at the pattern here. From His boldness, there's the approval, there's His freedom, which then produces love. How do we know that? Because verse 7, He uses this language. But, instead of the deceit, uncleanness, and guile, instead of the flattery, covetousness, and seeking glory, but, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you. We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were agapitas, well beloved. Once you get freedom from being the center of attention, from being all about you, for being made much of, now you're free to love people. We were bold in our God. How can we love a world if we're not people of integrity? Paul uses the language of a nurse that was, could be a, a wet nurse, a mother that couldn't breastfeed her children, would hire someone. Paul saw himself that way. The children belonged to God, but he was brought in kind of as a wet nurse. And there's cherishing or fostering. It also means to brood like a bird would brood over the eggs by warming them, sitting on them, or take them under their wing after they're hatched to protect and warm them. Paul said, that's what you are to me. How, Paul? You are not there very long. How did Paul love these people with their personality quirks? And I mean, Paul, I don't even think he had a hobby. What did he find in common with these people? In verse 8, he uses synonymous phrases, affectionately desirous, you were dear, and right in the center, he tells us why. We were willing not, we were willing to have imparted not the gospel of God only, because the gospel is what gives us tender affection for one another. See, in a culture of Christianity where people are looking for churches that they prefer and what can they do for me, and I want to ask you, do you love the people in this room? See, You couldn't get Paul to, to say, I'm going to give up on Thessalonica. Why? Because I, I love them. Where the gospel is taking root and being central, people become affectionate. So that was just Paul, you know. He just had this strange affection for people that we just don't have. Not so. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Romans chapter 12. Affection. Show affection as an in, a person of integrity from the heart. Not just say, I love you. You ever said that and not mean it? <laughs> I love you. I really don't. How can we really be people of integrity really mean it? The gospel melts our hearts and and makes us into loving people. The question is, do you love one another? Paul says, I can sincerely say, I really do. Because my confidence of approval and freedom produces love. And what was Paul doing? He was opening his soul to people. Now that's, that's risky, isn't it? You may open your soul to someone, they don't get it. They don't understand. you got to be careful. 
Paul said in chapter 3, we could no longer forbear. We could no longer forbear. What's he saying? He's, he's opening his soul, what he was thinking about these people. You are a crown in joy and rejoicing in the presence of Jesus Christ. He was opening his soul. Where the gospel becomes central and becomes, takes deep root in the heart. We begin to open ourselves to one another. And we share our fears, our concerns, our failures, our heartaches, our tears, our trials. Can you do that with anybody here? Do you know anybody that well? You should. Because you're a lover of Jesus. Just one, just two people. Your fellowship group, wherever it is. Say, well, they're not like me. We don't have the same hobbies. Who cares? <laughs> You're not like Jesus either. By nature. See, being together in a called out assembly is not being the same age and the same likes and the same hobbies. Fine if you have them. It's about having the same Savior. Therefore, by the gospel, you can love the hardest person to be loved, which is probably me some of the time, maybe most of the time. You can love me, and I can love you. So Paul's boldness, amazingly, is gentle. It's gentle. So this idea of militancy, like we're going to take over, and we're going to just really tell people what it's like, not Paul, he was gentle. Because he was a man of integrity. And he genuinely loved people. Beloved, when we understand it's not about me. It's about the Lord. Then we can start sharing our hearts with one another. And that, that's, that's risky. I can't tell you every time you do that, it's going to go well. You know, somebody may laugh because they're in the flesh. I don't know. It just is risk-taking, isn't it? You've got to take the risk. Where the gospel's finding deep root in a church... What you'll find is people will begin to share. And what that produces is, is a perseverance in the things of God. We're deeply connected. We've got something going on here more than, hey, we're both engineers. Or, we're both preachers. Or, we both like this sport. That'll die quickly. And we're both in the same family with God. See Paul's entrance... His confidence, His approval, His freedom, and His love. May we be a people that so loves by telling the truth to a culture that God would hope would use us to be pillars and ground of the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank